shoes off. This is serious. Okay. There's lipstick, and then there's red lipstick. It carries with it a symbolic value that we don't associate with pink or mauve or nude. Nefertiti, Queen Elizabeth I, witches and women of the night have all worn it. Throughout history, men have had to be protected by law from the evil, manipulative trickery of a red lip. The actress Sarah Bernhardt may have been responsible for bringing red lipstick into vogue. At a time when many women were still reluctant to wear cosmetics, the world-renowned actress, perhaps most famous for playing Hamlet, uh, brazenly applied it in public. But that might have been why red lipstick became a surprisingly feminist symbol for the suffragette movement. When Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Charlotte Perkins Gilman marched in the 1912 New York City suffragette march, they wore red lipstick. It soon began to be regarded as a look that represented female liberation. It became a legitimate symbol of power. My Oma, Ruth Rosina Reiser, was not an easy woman. Her own children used to call her Ruth Rosina Ruby Lips. Rosina Ruby Lips being the name of the witch in Hansel and Gretel. I'm told they did this in secret and at their own peril. If you've been in Bozeman for more than a heartbeat, and you've shopped at the Macy's or the Bon Marche in the last 25 years, you know my grandmother. She was the handsome woman in the accessories department with the white hair and the German accent. The first time you met her, she would have called you hun or love, and the second time, you would have gotten a squeeze. And by the third time, she would have figured out how the two of you related in the community, be it that your grandmother was in the Hope Lutheran Choir with her, or that you had a second cousin, twice removed, who had a dog walker that went to the same salon that she did. <laughs> Community was important to her. Ruth grew up in Germany during World War II. She was from Weinheim, a little town of cobbled streets and artists and musicians and two castles. She never let us forget two castles. A town that dated back to 755 AD a town of 45,000 nestled in a valley. My grandmother was ahead of her time, what we would call a feminist and she would call a human. She saw no difference between you and me, brown and white, gay and straight. When World War II came to her town, this kind of open-minded thinking wasn't rewarded. Fear was the flavor of the day. Women's rights took a nosedive under the rule of Hitler. In the interest of the state, German women were encouraged to have more children. In 1933, birth control was made illegal and family planning clinics were closed. At the same time, there were forced sterilizations of women who were among what they called the subhuman races. So be they Aryan or non-Aryan, women's bodies didn't belong to them, but to their racial community. When World War II ended, my grandmother had a rather favorable education and she spoke fluent English. This is how she landed a job working for the American Army as a secretary and a translator, and how she met a small town Montana boy, my grandfather, George Reiser. At 17, Ruth was married, the mother of a baby girl, and on her way to live the American dream. Across an ocean and a continent she flew, promise of a spectacular, free, fearless life ahead of her. And when she landed in Gallatin Field, in the 1940s, and those plane doors popped open. <gasps> Dust, green peas, and cattle as far as the eye could see. After the hardships of the war, my grandmother had been expecting a little more glamour, a little more luxury, and a lot more equality. I'm not sure she ever forgave the world for failing her in that. This was not the life she envisioned for herself and she wasn't very good at it. No one would deny that Ruth was volcanic in her emotions, in her passions, in her desires. She lived her own operatic version of life, more Handel's Cleopatra than Donna Reed, and we were never sure if we were going to be the hero or the villain in her story. Ruth loved beautiful things. Art, opera, delicate porcelain, and stained glass filled her home. She loved being beautiful, and she had drawers full of lotions, perfumes, and lipstick. I guess her lipstick addiction is genetic. World War II drove red lipstick to the forefront of women's fashion. Rosie the Riveter, iconic heroine, sported the look as a symbol of strength. Colors like 
Fighting Red, Patriot Red, and Brave Red hit the shelves, and ladies were encouraged to look their best and do their best. Red lipstick has had some famous detractors, though. Adolf Hitler hated the trend. The Aryan ideal was a pure scrubbed face. Female visitors to Hitler's country retreat were actually given a little list of things they must not do. Avoid excessive cosmetics, avoid red lipstick, and on no account ever were they to paint their fingernails. During the war, having your lipstick on was part of your fight against the enemy. The power of red lipstick doesn't end with World War II. In the movie, Why I Wore Red Lipstick to My Mastectomy, when the protagonist explains, I love red lipstick because it's a choice. Wearing it shows confidence, demands that the world pay attention, and dares you to live up to it. So after thinking about it, Ruby Lips might be the perfect name for my Oma, if she'll forgive me. Women who wear red do not shuffle or apologize. They move through life like battleships, never sorry for who they are. Red is not a wishy-washy color. So this year, I'm wearing red, not pink or mauve or nude. Red, full throttle red, ruby lips. It's a hard color, doesn't go with everything. It clashes fiercely with others. Red has grit and determination. It's the color of our hearts. It's animalistic. In medieval art, red was the color of selfless love, like Christ's love for humanity. Agape, the unconditional love. Like lava and blood and lipstick and the velvet curtains that close at the end of an opera, all red. <laughs>